Good morning, and for some of you, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Reynolds. I'm an International Arbitration Associate at Mayor Brown, and I'm serving as the North American Regional Coordinator for the ICC's Young Arbitrators Forum. I'm honored to moderate today's webinar. Joining me today as presenters are Jim Ferguson, Jim Tankula, Jeffrey Cohen, Quinn Smith, and David Kay. Jim Ferguson is a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. He focuses his practice on intellectual property, complex commercial litigation, and domestic and international arbitration. Jim Tinkula is a litiga litigation partner also in Mayor Brown's Chicago office. Jim has represented clients engaged in domestic and international arbitrations and litigations across various industries. Jeff Cohen is managing principal at M Analysis Group. Jeff has more than 25 years of experience as an economics expert, including experience in international arbitrations across a wide range of industries. Quinn Smith is a partner at Common Smith. He's cross-examined numerous experts in courts and before arbitration tribunals, including both commercial and investment arbitration. Quinn is also a North American Regional Coordinator for the ICC's Young Arbitrators Forum. David Kay is a partner at Drinkle, Drinker, Biddle & Reese and also is an English barrister. David concentrates his practice on international corporate transactions. He advises foreign and U.S. companies and financial institutions on their overseas operations. David has sat as an arbitrator in over 90 matters, most of which were complex international disputes. Before we begin, a few housekeeping announcements. First, as we go along, we hope that you'll ask questions by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We'll make every effort to answer your questions towards the end of the webinar. If we're unable to answer your questions during the presentation, we'll follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. Second, regarding CLE credit, we'll be providing an alphanumeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Let's get started. The ICC released a new set of rules this year dealing with experts. So we thought it pertinent to spend some time talking about the use of experts in international arbitrations generally and how it differs from traditional litigation. Without further delay, I'd like to start with Jim Tankula on the topic of selecting experts for an international arbitration. Jim, can you tell us how expert selection in international arbitration differ from traditional litigation? Well, first of all, we have to remember that part of our the, the, the role of an expert uh, in if you're selecting as as the party is to help um, win your case and persuade the triers of fact, the arbitrators. And therefore, when you're looking at individuals or firms to be your experts, you're looking for people that will uh, be able to uh, be persuasive to uh, the arbitrators. And you're not looking at, for example, a, a broader jury. You're looking for specialists. And so you think about, and if you're looking from in an international arbitration, generally you have um, arbitrators from different countries. And so you're looking at um, somebody who's going to be able to um, be persuasive and um, draw the respect of the arbitrators. And in doing that, I think you, um, you, you look for uh, individuals that have a, a, a good international uh, reputation because you're looking for credibility. And that's what I think is, you know, sort of your, it's just more of the audience. It's your, a lot of these would be the same in traditional litigation mm -hmm. or court litigation, but importantly is you just got to know you have a different audience. So in addition to considering the fact that your, your audience in an international arbitration is an arbitrator as opposed to a jury, are there different selection methods that are employed in arbitrations as opposed to in litigation? Well, yes, you know, if we look at the, um, you know, generally I would say that most uh, experts uh, are um, selected by the parties. Um, but there are also instances where the panel, the arbitration panel itself, will want to hire the expert um, to be paid for by the parties. Um, and then third is with the new um, ICC rules, there's the ICC's um, expertise center at which the ICC can, in, when requested and agreed to by the parties, uh, can appoint an expert. Uh, talking here with the other um, panelists and that, it seems that, um, I, I, in my own opinion, is predominantly we're going to continue to still see party-appointed experts as the, um, as the norm. Great. Um, are there any 
any considerations that are unique to international arbitration when you're selecting an expert or any um, unique types of experts that you see in international arbitrations that you wouldn't typically see in the traditional litigation context? Uh, yes, again, we go back to the, the first question. Some that we're looking at different, um, we have a, a broader audience. We have a different audience than the arbitrators that we're trying to convince. So um, one, we're looking for um, people who will um, be persuasive to different um, cultures. People also, when you have an expert, you also, they're, they need to be working with your clients. And so you have to have experts who are going to get along with your clients as well. We're going to be able to um, understand some of the issues that your clients have, and that's very important to make sure that you have experts that are compatible um, with working with your clients, so that they can get the best, the right information on your clients, work with them well, um, have the confidence of your clients. Um, that nobody wants to go to to a hearing or with um, uh, experts that your clients don't trust. Um, you need to, so you have to be thinking about those those type of uh, cultural considerations, um, and in doing that, you're looking for people with international expertise um, that are familiar with things outside of just if you were doing a domestic case of, you know, more of the just the U.S. thinking or common law thinking. Sometimes, if you're in a uh, civil law area, and um, I would say also one of the other things to consider now is this becoming, I think, more and more frequent in international arbitrations is the uh, expert confrontation, or sometimes it's called hot tubbing, where the experts get in a, uh, are at the end after they've given their testimony and been cross-examined, the arbitrators will have like a final day or final half a day where they get all the experts together and they'll debate the issues. So when you're, look, when you're looking to hire an expert, one of the things in addition to looking for somebody who's gonna be persuasive to the arbitrators, now you have to start thinking about an expert who's going to be able to uh, be persuasive to other experts, be able to hold his own or her own in the, in the hot tub. You're looking for somebody, in other words, who's going to own the hot tub. <laughs> and so you gotta, you got to, I think you really have to uh, be thinking about that in your selection when you're, and um, that's why I do believe that interviewing the experts in person is very important um, for international arbitration, especially to be sure you're not going to find somebody who's, going to be offensive to the arbitrators or, um, or to your clients. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Jim Ferguson to talk about presenting expert evidence in international arbitrations and how that differs from traditional context. Jim, can you talk about how expert presentation in international arbitration differs? Thanks, Sarah. As you know, there are several important differences between the presentation of experts in litigation, U.S. style litigation, and international arbitration. And many of these differences flow from the differences in the selection of the experts. As Jim Tankula mentioned, uh, in international arbitration, you can have a tribunal appointed expert. The IBA rules on the taking of evidence in Article 6 lays out the procedure for a tribunal appointed expert. And under this pr procedure, the tribunal can, after consulting with the parties, can appoint an expert and then require the parties to provide that expert with all relevant documents and information. The expert then generates a report and testifies at the hearing. And so in this circumstance, the, the expert um, is not within the control of either of the parties and the idea is this comes closer to a neutral and independent expert. With party-appointed experts, there are also differences in the presentation. As you know, under classic U.S.-style litigation, the model is for the expert to generate a report and then to provide testimony at the hearing. Uh, usually, uh, the tribunal will allow the party to present direct evidence with an expert and then cross-examination by the opposing party. But in international arbitration, there are often some variations on this model. For example, the IBA rules give the tribunal the authority to require the experts to conference. And the purpose of the conferencing is to identify points of agreement and disagreement and thereby narrow the issues. And 
And this process will lead to a report that summarizes the difference, and that obviously will dictate the content of the presentation. And then finally, as Jim Tacula mentioned, increasingly in international arbitration, you have uh, tribunals relying on the hot tub phenomenon, and uh, under the IBA rules, this process is one in which, quote, I'm reading from the IBA rules, Article 8, witnesses can be questioned at the same time and in confrontation with each other. And many tribunals have found this to be a useful technique, both in narrowing the issues and in separating the credible from the not-so-credible claims. Interesting. Do you do you have an opportunity to advocate for, you know, obviously you don't necessarily get to choose how the expert is going to present to the arbitrator, but do you have an opportunity to advocate for how that will happen? Under um, the IBA rules, in the case of a tribunal-appointed expert, the tribunal is required in the first instance to consult with the parties. And then to, once the tribunal has made at least a tentative selection of the expert, the parties have an opportunity to object. And so in, in that circumstance, the parties do play a role, albeit more limited, in the selection of the experts than they do when it's a party-appointed expert. And do you have a preferred method of presentation? Do you prefer hot tubbing to, um, you know, making a request to the arbitrator that your experts are allowed to, to give a presentation before they're examined? I, I, notwithstanding the um, commitment of international arbitration to an independent and neutral expert, <laughs> lawyers want their experts to be advocates for their position. They want them to create the appearance of being credible and neutral, <laughs> but they want them to be advocates for their position. And so as a result, they uh, lawyers generally prefer the party-appointed expert in which they can shape and present the testimony and prepare the expert for cross. And that means in the uh, hot tubbing scenario, the lawyer does not have as much control. And therefore, uh, there's an increased risk that when your expert is challenged by the opposing expert, um, the outcome may not be as rosy as it would have been if you had more influence in presenting the testimony. So your hot tubbing is not your preferred method? It, 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 no, it's not my preferred method. Um, I've had pretty good experience with hot tubbing, but that was because my expert was sufficiently knowledgeable, sufficiently tenacious, and sufficiently um, assertive to win the hot tub, to use Jim's phrase, and so, which underlines the importance of selecting the expert. Right. Well, I'll ask the, the same question later on in our presentation to David Kay, our arbitrator, and to, to Jeff Cohen, our, our expert, to see if they have different answers on uh, preferred methods for presentation. Um, have you seen, there seems to be an increasing use of technology and um, more technologically advanced demonstratives, even in a traditional court situation. Have you seen that same development in international arbitration with experts? Yes, and it uh, depends on a couple of things. One is the technical background of the tribunal. The other is the issue, the nature of the issue and the importance of the issue to your case. And then the third is the expert um, himself or herself. And what I mean by that is if you have an expert who is comfortable using demonstratives, this creates a, a, a very good opportunity for you to use this as a teaching moment. Your goal is to provide an expert that, the, that will have sufficient credibility with the panel, and the best model to doing that is um, as, as a teacher to a student. And the, if you have an expert who is comfortable with demonstratives, that can really enhance the persuasiveness of the presentation. All of this, of course, depends on the issue. Some issues don't lend themselves to demonstratives, and so it's a non-starter in that context. Switching topics now, one commonly hears that international arbitration offers relaxed procedural and evidentiary rules. I'd like to turn to Quinn Smith to talk about the implications of that aspect of international arbitration, particularly for experts. Quinn, can you talk to us about what the consequences are for those relaxed procedural and evidentiary rules in international arbitration? Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much. In, in the context of the relaxed procedural rules, I mean, some of the, the positives that you're going to get is that you can do uh, more creative things. Um, for example, we've seen joint expert reports. Maybe you can put two experts together 
talk about two different pieces of the same thing. And, and that's something that would be quite difficult to do, if not impossible, in the context of litigation. Um, at the same time, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to challenge an expert based on what might be considered junk science or things that just aren't supported by the literature. So tribunals are reticent to get rid of evidence before a hearing or even after a hearing so that they can protect the award from being challenged. And so often you'll see tribunals say, we'll, we'll let the evidence in and then we'll give it our, our own um, analysis and we'll weigh, it, we'll weigh it separately. But this, this presents a lot of problems. I mean, first, it's, the social sciences are quite clear that there are inherent uh, biases, things like the halo effect, things like confirmation bias, and whenever all the evidence comes in, it can still have an impact on, on the decision. The other thing is that sometimes tribunals can take a long time to rule. And so after perhaps nine, 10 months, maybe the cross-examination isn't as fresh in the minds of the experts, I mean, sorry, of the tribunal. Maybe they don't want to go back to the transcript to read, and maybe they just turn to the extra report such in, in a scenario where it can be influential, even though it may not be supported by, supported by the science. So for us, this is one of the real, the real struggles um, that you have whenever you're looking at the increased flexibility and the creativity, but at the same time, the difficulty with uh, challenging junk science. So there are no, there's no equivalent of a Daubert or a Fry motion in the context of international arbitration then? There is nothing in uh, any rules that I've seen uh, in, in practice. Uh, I've never even seen it attempted. I can see a situation where maybe you just have something that is just so frivolous and so bad, the tribunal might consider it. Uh, but it, it's the, the tendency of tribunals is not even to uh, throw out evidence prior to the hearing or even afterwards. So while there is nothing written, even in practice or in custom, you don't find anything similar to a dog or a fly motion. And let, let's clarify what we're talking about when we say junk science. Um, Correct me if, if this is different than your understanding, Quinn, but we need an expert that's offering an opinion on a subject about which he or she doesn't have any relevant qualifications and or a report that doesn't reach sound conclusions or doesn't employ a sound methodology, correct? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and these are, you know, those kinds of situations where maybe it's on the fringes, uh, maybe there's a couple of articles out there, and, you know, to the untrained lawyer arbitrator, it can be difficult to really find out if it is an accepted methodology or an accepted way of reaching the conclusion. So given that there are no juries involved in international arbitrations, you know, you have an arbitrator or a tribunal as the decision maker, um, you know, and since there are not currently any, you know, any Daubert or Fry equivalents in inter international arbitration, in your opinion, should there be, should there be a procedural mechanism that allows parties to object to junk science so that you're not expending resources and time addressing meritless reports? Yeah, I, I do think there should be. And, and one of the best examples for this is that when I talk to most experts and I ask them about international arbitration, they say that they like it because it's substantially easier than litigation. <laughs> So that the expert feels more comfortable with the fact that they don't have to be as rigorous. And we're talking about large disputes that are very complex. And we're talking about often cross-examination of an expert that might be an hour and a half, two hours long. The ability to really get into the, the methodology and whether it's accepted or not in the scientific community or the relevant community that's applicable to the case can be crucial. And, and for the international arbitration community to assume that tribunals can weed out the grain from the chaps by themselves or perhaps in such a limited framework, I think uh, asks for too much and I think that it doesn't take into account what the social sciences have taught us regarding information or evidence that is 
presented. So this also raises an interesting point then for um, expert selection. I don't know, Jim, if you have thoughts about this, but um, you know, if you don't have, you know, one of the first things I do when when we're selecting an expert is go in on Westlaw or Lexis and do a search to make sure they've never been eliminated based on a Daubert or a Fry motion, nor you go find whatever you can of any of their prior testimony to see how they performed. And in the arbitration context here, you don't have the benefit of Daubert and Fry, and you also have confidential proceedings, so you probably can't go and read their prior testimony. Um, so that it seems to be to create sort of an opaqueness when you're selecting experts in the international arbitration context. Is that is that an issue you've had to deal with? Yes, I think one of the things when and that goes to um, good interviewing of your expert. What you really want to do is be sure that you're um, looking. Uh, when you talk with your expert, that you uh, you vet them properly to understand uh, what, what what where they've testified before and what the results were, um, because our arbitrators talk to each other and they may have something nice or not nice to say about some of the experts. Um, the uh, I I I think that's a very important fact. The other thing is you you know to the extent you can, you should read. Um, and depending on the expert, they may have a lot of published material. Uh, one of the dangers there is you have to watch out for the expert who has, um, uh, there's a phrase, no unpublished thoughts. Those, uh, those, those experts who, have, um, who opine on everything or blog um, frequently can be a very dangerous expert, and you might want to think twice about somebody who's always on social media writing something and that because uh, the other side will be doing that type of research uh, that they may not find from what you've what you've done in the formal setting, but they'll have a lot of um, uh, thoughts out there that can be used against you. Thanks, Jim. We have we have a question from the audience that it's timely to address. Um, someone wrote in asking what a Daubert or a Fry motion is. We have a number of non-U.S. international participants on the on the call, so for their benefit, we'll explain that these are motions that you filed. Um, after an expert report has been submitted challenging basically the qualifications of the expert to render the opinion. Um, and so the experts are often eliminated from a case early on if the reports don't meet certain standards, which saves parties the expense of addressing and responding to that report throughout you know, the entire litigation. And it, it saves the decision maker, whether it be a jury or, or a judge, the, um, the trouble of, of having to address the report as well in making their decision. Um, turning back to, to Quinn, Quinn, do you have any strategies for, given the fact that when there is junk science in an international arbitration, it's likely to stick around to the end, do you have any strategies that you employ for dealing with junk science? Yeah, I, I think in the context of international arbitration um, it's in, and junk science, uh, it's, it's important to really use your your time well. So um, we tend to stay away from lots of questions trying to maybe discredit the witness based on how much they're charging, um, how many cases they've testified in for the party, uh, things that, that may be um, influential in front of a, a jury, maybe to a, a lay person. They might be really shocked at the, the rates, for example, that an expert charges. To, to, Stay away from that uh, to try to really use your time to talk to your own expert if you have one and really get at those core questions that go to the methodology uh, and, and attack the premises uh, that the expert is opining on and not so much some of the more typical credibility attacks that, that tend to be uh, a waste. I think it's also uh, important to, to to do what you can. I know it's hard to find published material, perhaps by an expert or their opinions in other cases, but some of these folks are re repeat players. And, and sometimes they appear before maybe the same arbitrators and take different positions. And it, it is worthwhile to do whatever digging is out there to try to find those situations where the expert has taken a contradictory position on the same theory, perhaps an academic theory, or perhaps a way of calculating a discount rate, and, and to go to those things and to bring them to the attention of the tribunal before the hearing so that you have a chance not only to question the expert on it, 
but to characterize it in in the briefing and to get more more use out of it since they're you're not going to be able to exclude the expert of, and try to get the most mileage out of those those kinds of either contradictions or just weaknesses in the, the formulas and the conclusions. Thanks, Gwen. I'm turning now to David Kay. Many of our participants in this webinar are, are practitioners and would, would value from hearing value from hearing from you in particular given your experience as an arbitrator and uh, perhaps you can give us a glimpse behind the decision maker's curtain. Uh, David what, in your opinion, makes a great or a terrible expert report? Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think what makes a, a good expert report is one that is simple, focused, addresses the points methodically, and with a clear analysis of the, the various issues. To work through the points at issue and address each of them succinctly. And the reason I say that is because on an international panel, uh, if you've got, say, three arbitrators, you will invariably have uh, foreign arbitrators, i.e. non-US or non-UK, and English may be their second language. They may also be from a civil law jurisdiction, not a common law jurisdiction. And their approach to reading an expert's report is quite different because the civil lawyers, civil arbitrators, um, much more accustomed to relying entirely on the, on the expert report and what it says. And the common law arbitrators tend to read the report but also give a lot of weight to the, the actual evidence and the testimony that the expert gives. Um, and a, another point is that one thing that I, I would say very frequently gives arbitrators problems in, in just assessing the reports is where both reports may be good, but they approach the questions differently. And one thing that, that I have done um, on a number of occasions is when we're going through the, the, the pre-hearing conferences with counsel and planning the hearing, I'll suggest as far as counsel can together, is sit together and explain to both their experts, this is how we would like your report to read. So, you know, what are, what are the issues? And if you can address each of the issues together, issues one, two, three, four, five, so that when we are reading the report, we can read what one expert says on point one, and instead of wondering where the other expert addresses this, we can actually go to his or her report and find out the exact analysis. And it, it seems a very simple point, but seldom it isn't done. And I think Quinn was the one who mentioned that, you know, sometimes, hopefully, it doesn't take nine or ten months to get a, an award out, but it can take quite some time. And he's absolutely right that when you're trying to assess all the evidence you've heard, you invariably go back and read the expert report. Um, the arbitrators will have annotated the report, and you rely very heavily on what is in that report. Yes, you do read the transcript, and you, you go back and review the, the testimony, but I would say when you're reviewing it for the award, you rely very heavily on the, the report itself. And, you know, what makes a bad report? Probably the opposite of what I've just said. But um, where it's unstructured and where um, technical terms have been used and they haven't been explained very well. And that's, that's another point. Um, you know, if there are technical terms, um, and these technical terms may have been used in, throughout the arbitration on the, the lay witness testimony, Sometimes the experts have a different interpretation of those terms, and they don't always point that out in the, in the expert report. Thank you, David. And we, we, we talked earlier to Jim Ferguson about you know, his, when he has the opportunity to advocate for a presentation method in an, in an arbitration that um, his first choice is not expert conferencing. I wonder what your preferred method for receiving live testimony is. Um, well, with, without a doubt, uh, in person if possible, 
because you can then you can judge the demeanor of the the expert, um, just the the credibility. I mean, so it's like it's the same issue you have with a uh, you know with a lay witness, and sometimes the witness, the the experts can come across um, very competently, and others others not so competently. And um, it also is, is much easier for you to ask questions when the, the expert is there. Sometimes it's just not possible to do. Uh, and in that case, um, you have to have conferences. Um, and sometimes they're video conferences. I, far, I much prefer video conferences to telephone conferences. I think a telephone conference for expert testimony um, you know, that, that, in my view, is almost to be avoided at all costs. Video is much better. Sometimes you have to have it, uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's fair enough. But without a doubt, I think to have the, the expert appear in person, both experts appear together, is, uh, is by far preferable uh, in person. And the other thing that I, I like to do, and again, one has to discuss this with counsel, is that sometimes you, know, you, have, you have a claimant's case, and then the claimant expert goes on at the end of that case. Then you have the respondent's case, and the respondent's expert goes on at the end of that case. Um, and I always prefer to hear the two experts together, because there's no question about it. If you can, you know, you get, you get into the into the theme and, and the understanding, the analysis of the expert's case. And if you can have both together, it just helps to keep your train of thought going. It's very difficult um, to have one, the claimant's expert, for example, at the end of the claimant's case, and then possibly a week or even two weeks later, you have the respondent's expert. And in many cases, we've said, look, we need you know, both experts back with a lot of questions. So that's just a matter. Some council don't like that. Um, but if we can arrange that, then that is what we would prefer to do as, as most arbitration panels, I think. So another common um, difference between international arbitration and, and litigation is that you tend not to allow direct examination of witnesses and arbitrations and instead sort of warm the seat briefly and move right into cross-examination. Do you ever make an exception for experts and allow them to give an affirmative presentation of their report before cross-examination? Um, what we, I mean, and this, this again varies significantly, but what I would normally do, and I think I prefer, is you have the expert report. And the key is to get a copy of that report as, as early as you can before the hearing. I realize that counsel you know, obviously don't want to release it too early because there's still evidence, evidentiary issues that they're working on, the factual issues. But if, if the panel can get the, the report, let's say at least four to six weeks before the hearing, then the panel can read it. And if there are issues that come out, we will raise it with counsel. Now, those issues can be, um, you know, the presentation, the format, the methodology. If there's something we just don't understand or we feel one of the experts hasn't addressed something that the other expert has addressed in great detail, we'd raise it with counsel and ask them to go back to the experts and say, can you, you know, talk to the expert about this and, and, and correct this because this is going to be a problem for the panel at the hearing. Uh, another thing we, we've talked about the uh, you know the, the qualifications of, of experts again uh, it's very helpful to get the, the the CVs or the resumes of the experts um, as soon as possible uh, and as early as possible in the hearing and certainly not the night before um, which which invariably happens I mean sometimes we've had cases where we've got the expert report, even though we've asked for it to be earlier, it's come to us, you know, three or four days before the hearing, and and that that doesn't do justice and doesn't help the the, the clients involved or, or the counsel involved on the case. Interesting. 
Um, do you ever ask experts questions directly, or do you tend to rely on parties to present, to, to draw the material out for you? Uh, yes, we will always ask experts questions directly. Uh, and I, I think that you have to do that to understand, um, depending upon the topic, to understand what the expert is saying. Um, because if it's a very technical issue, you've got to remember that probably at least two members of the panel are not, not as well versed in the topic as maybe the third member. Uh, I know that when a panel is selected, one always tries to get someone who has some expertise in the in the topic at issue with, with the claim. Um, and I think it's, it's important to do that. Uh, I, I would, I'd have great difficulty if I was chairman of a panel and we were hearing expert testimony and my two wing arbitrators weren't asking any questions. Um, I just wonder whether it was whether they did not understand it. And I would ask them, obviously, when we recessed, um, why no questions? Thank you. Going back to the topic that, that Quinn discussed, have you ever been confronted with what we're calling junk science in, in any of the procedures that you've participated or proceedings you've participated in? Yes. Um, although <laughs> it's junk science seems to, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's an area that's sort of come to light at least in the cases that I've been involved in the last three or four years. I don't know if it's a, it's a new term that, that's, that's used a lot. Um, within international arbitration, I mean, it's, it's I, I haven't, uh, I must admit, disqualified an expert um, for so-called junk science. What we have done, and this goes back to getting the, the details on the expert as early as possible in the proceeding is gone back you know, on the next conference call with, with counsel, say we've gone through the, the CVs and if this is the issue on, on, you know, one, on one topic, we didn't see how this expert had, had the, uh, you know, the background and the expertise. Um, and we've sometimes also invited counsel to ask, to raise any questions that they may have on the opposing counsel's expert, again, well before the hearing. There is, there is nothing, I think, worse or more, or, or, or more time consuming and frustrating to the client to find that you know, the ex, you're at the hearing, the expert reports are in, the experts are called to testify, and, and counsel's going through their starts with their resume and CV. Um, you know, we've, we've looked at that beforehand and to try and challenge the qualifications. I mean, that's, that's just bad case management. Um, so it's, it's, it's much more difficult to, to disqualify a, uh, an arbitrator, a junk science in an arbitration that is in litigation. And I, again, I think it was Quinn who made the, the very relevant point that um, you know, unless there's something glaring, which I think would have been picked up before we got to the hearing, there, there is a tendency for the arbitration panels to say, well, we're going to, we're going to listen to the expert, and um, you know, if there's areas we're not, we feel he may not be qualified, we'll give it whatever weight we feel appropriate. It's, it's not the best way to proceed, but I would say that it is, tends to be the, the, the most dominant method of proceeding with junk science, unless it's something glaring. Well, I think one of the issues, is, Jim, thank you, I was jumping in, is um, that I have to find with arbitrators is that what, one of the few ways you can overturn an <laughs> award is failure to take on evidence, and arbitrators are worried about that as our uh, parties, that if um, you, you may not challenge an expert because you'd be afraid that a, a court may overturn the award because they didn't listen to the junk science. Uh, and since that's a uh, concern, um, that's why you won't see many motions to strike experts for their testimony. And, and it does seem to you a fair trade-off. You know, you do get all these relaxed procedural and evidentiary rules, right, in, our, in international arbitration. And one of, one of the consequences is that you don't get to eliminate bad claims and bad experts early. Um. Yes, I mean the the 
the arbitration rules that we, as we've talked about, are very flexible, and um, for the international hearings, and that is that is a plus in many respects. But there are also, from the from the arbitrator's point of view, sometimes you would actually like far, further and finer guidelines. So we actually know what we can do and what we can't, um, because you know sometimes. Uh, not every time, but sometimes counsel will will take advantage of the fact that they know the panel doesn't have firm guidelines and has to exercise its discretion. And where we where we really, or I say we, I'm talking about an arbitration panel, where the real challenge comes to the front is where you have a case, an international arbitration, and let's say we have you know an American. Uh, attorney who has a litigation practice as well as an arbitration practice on one side and a civil law lawyer on the other. So we, we have um, the two extremes and, and you know that is that's difficult because what you're then trying to do is is find a common area um, on all on all issues, you know, expert testimony um, testimony of witnesses generally, because you're trying to, to bring two very different methods of hearing cases together from the civil law side and the common law side and, um, and, and find common ground. And that's, that's where it's very difficult to do. And last question for you, David. Do you have any thoughts on the increasing use of expert conferencing or, or hot tubbing in arbitration? <laughs> Yes, hot tubbing is another, um, I think, uh, uh, another process that's come to the fore in the last couple of years. Uh, I've used it probably three or four times, and I, I think as Jim Takula was saying, um, it really depends a lot on the uh, experience of your expert and both experts. Are they familiar with this? Can they sort of you know, jostle with each other on the various points. And one of the problems I have with it, and I, I'm generally not in favor of it, I would have to say, but twice I've had an instance where one of the arbitrators who had a, you know, they have invariably many arbitrators are, are, are litigators, and they have taken it upon themselves to almost conduct a cross-examination of both experts. And the concern I have with that is that it is very difficult to balance your, um, your questions. I, I mean, the arbitrators can certainly ask questions, and they, they should and they do. But as I say, I've had two instances where, where one of the arbitrators was a very a very well known uh, barrister QC in England, who actually started a cross examination. I had to speak to him in the recess, tell him he shouldn't proceed like this. It was it was very clear, um, in my view, that he was he was cross examining one expert in much greater detail the other than the other, and it, we had a lot of foreign parties involved in the arbitration. We were in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, it was, I, I was just very concerned the way that was going. But, uh, you know, it, I think it depends, again, on, on the situation. But in general terms, I'm not in favor of hot tubbing. Well, thank you, David. Uh, switching now to Jeffrey Cohen, given your extensive experience as an expert in international arbitration, I'm sure you also have value, valuable insights for us to consider. Um, as an expert, how can clients and lawyers help you put together the best possible report? Well, I'd say, I mean, I, my simplest answer is to get started early. Uh, I think that clients often want to manage, manage the case from a budget standpoint by kind of delaying getting experts involved. But I think that has two problems. One is often when you wait too long to get the experts involved, you wind up having to really put the pedal to the metal late in the day, and that can wind up really escalating costs. Um, the other is probably more important in some ways, which is that if you get the experts involved early, they can help with discovery requests. 
and with kind of laying the evidentiary foundation that you need for the expert. So my, my advice is always get, get going earlier. It's probably more cost effective in the end. And are there things that clients or lawyers do that are particularly not helpful in, in getting you a best possible expert report? Um, yeah, well, besides delaying, I think I, one thing I think is, is I'll take the opposite of that, which is really helpful, is if they also have a person, uh, you know, someone who's got some economics background, often it's an associate on the case, really start to live with the experts. And, and I'm speaking with, from my perspective as evaluation or damages or economics expert, I know there's many other types of experts used. But in our work, uh, often there's someone on the case who has an undergraduate or sometimes even a graduate degree in business or economics. And when they've kind of lived and breathed our work uh, alongside us, it makes, um, it, it really helps dovetail with the experts' work with the case. And then ultimately turns into a way better way to present um, the cross-examination of the opposite size expert. So interesting. Do you, now we've asked the same question to our arbitrator and to our practitioners. Do you have a preferred method of, of presenting testimony as an expert? So with respect to hot tubbing or, or not? Or, or yeah. giving an affirmative presentation before cross-examination or... Um, yeah, I, I like giving the affirmative presentation as long as it's pretty short. I think in 25, 30 minutes in a complicated case, you should be able to get your, your main points across. Um, I don't... Uh, share the same uh, concern over hot tubbing that I think the lawyers here do, though I certainly understand their concern. Um, it doesn't particularly bother me to be in that situation. I do absolutely agree with them, though, that you need to, you know, own the hot tub or be able to turn up the temperature of the hot tub or whatever the right analogy is. You, can, you cannot be a pushover in that situation. And actually, you have to probably be even more seen as an advocate when you're thrown right next to your opponent as opposed to going on sequentially uh, in a case. You know, something I want to pick up on that is, uh, that's really interesting in this conversation is the um, position you're in with in international arbitration not being able to challenge junk science with Daubert or, um, say, a Fry motion. I think that one of the most important things uh, you need an expert to do is to bring out what I would call the junk elements in somebody's analysis. You might have two experts who both present, say, a DCF, a discounted cash flow in um, an evaluation situation. But our job as good experts is to find what's wrong beneath, you know, what's wrong underneath the hood. And very oftentimes there's a framework that's completely uh, credible, so say a DCF, but underneath will be, you know, assumptions, you know, predicates, pieces that are really junk underneath. And I think in this context, you probably especially need the expert to bring those out. Thank you. Good insight. Um, what do you wish that clients looked for in hiring experts and or that arbitrators looked for in evaluating experts? If there were particular aspects or qualities that you wish would be highlighted, what would they be? Um, you know, I think credibility is, is key. I mean, we're, we're not advocates as much as uh, the clients would like us to think we are. Um, you know, really coming across as, as truthful and credible and genuinely being truthful and credible is absolutely critical, I think. Um, that's not to say that, that you can't be, um, you know, useful, more or less useful uh, in the way you present your work. Um, but I think that that's kind of first and foremost our jobs. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, one last question that I'll, I'll toss out to the panel. One of the great benefits of international arbitration for a lot of clients is that you actually get to select your decision maker, right? You get to choose the arbitrator. Um, how relevant is the expert, the expertise related to the underlying dispute to that decision to, to the arbitrator that you select? Are you, are you looking for somebody that has you know, an industry background similar to the case that you're putting forth? It depends on the strength of my case. <laughs> <laughs> if I am a winner, I want somebody who knows the industry. <laughs> yeah, let, let me just jump in on that question. This is David Kay. Um, 
from, a, from the, the panel's point of view, it is very helpful to have someone, um, an arbitrator on the panel who has the industry expertise. If, if that's the type of thing that would be required, for example, I was the chairman of a panel and it was um, the case involved um, a number of grain silos in Port Said in Egypt. And um, there is a natural fact, a whole grain industry and an industry, grain industry association, and it got into a lot of the, the processing of grain and the production of grain and the shipment of grain. And one, one big issue in the case was what was the normal practice in, in these grain silos and, and, and how they were operated. And we had one, one arbitrator who um, was not a lawyer, but he'd spent his entire career in the grain industry essentially doing just this. Um, and he was extremely helpful, and he was very objective. Um, and it was, it was a great help to us. So I think that from the panel's point of view, if there's someone who has some industry expertise where it's needed, it is very helpful. So one, one risk from the advocate's point of view is that the expertise of the arbitrator may uh, prevent him or her from considering other positions, arguments, approaches that are inconsistent with his or her experience. In other words, like all of us, they are to some extent prisoners of their own experience. And if they get locked into a position by virtue of their experience before having heard the facts, then that's going to limit your ability to persuade. So if I have, if I, in the abstract, were given a choice between an experienced arbitrator who uh, experienced in deciding complex commercial disputes and an arbitrator who did not have the same experience in deciding commercial disputes but had deep experience in the particular issues uh, involved, I always go with the experienced arbitrator because I won't run the risk that my position is going to be inconsistent with the experience of the arbitrator with expertise. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think broadly speaking, if I have a construction arbitration, I want somebody who knows who's done construction arbitrations before. If I have an energy oil and gas, I want somebody who's done oil and gas arbitrations. But getting the somebody who's experienced in you know, it was a drilling expert in a drilling case is very dangerous from the advocate side, from the client side. I think it goes to the, one of the questions that we have up there. Um, how far should a yes, you want to read that? Yes, it, does, it does, dovetails with a question from the audience. How far should a tribunal go when independently checking issues raised in expert reports as long as it avoids juris novit curiae, thanks to the Latin, uh, by giving parties a chance to be heard on any new issues raised? David. Uh, yeah, this is David Kay. Um, I, I think we, I think they do. I mean, I've been on cases where we have um, looked at at the. Sorry, can you put the question back? <laughs> <laughs> Questions just disappear. Thanks. Um, in, in checking issues uh, amongst ourselves, we haven't uh gone out and and retained anyone independently to do that and wouldn't do so uh unless we talk to council obviously we have um quite frequently and sometimes we've checked issues um ourselves on the resources available to us and made a list and then gone back to council and said look we have these questions with respect to um, the experts. We may have a conference call after the hearing and um, go say we have questions on the expert reports and go through and these you know these are the questions and this is why we have them and would your expert like to respond you know within 14 days or something. We've, we've certainly done that but I think that would be the, the extent of our own independent checking. Yeah again as a practitioner I've had um, Experiences like what David just described, and I always appreciate it if the arbitrators came back to the parties and said, this is the question, and this is our check, and we've looked at that, um, so that there is a chance to, um, for the parties to be heard on um, any questions or issues that the uh, arbitrators may have independently researched. 
Thanks, Jim. Um, I do want to save, we have a few questions from our participants, and I do want to save, um, we have just a, a couple minutes left. So um, I'll just toss this one out to the panel, but there was a very well-known Brazilian arbitration um, involving a, a construction company in Sao Paulo where the courts overturned the award because the tribunal refused to hear accounting experts. Is there more to the question? No. Um, I think there was one before that that was interesting. This one. Okay. Uh, given a straight choice, would you rather hire the deep industry expert but who has not testified before and may be unfamiliar with the arbitration process or an experienced testifying general quantum expert who can research the data needed? So this is sort of the opposite. This is a question for the right. related to the expert that we were just talking about with respect to the arbitrator. So, um, thoughts? I, uh, this is Jim Ferguson. I, my strong bias, again, prisoner of our own experience, is to opt for the testifying expert. The, the individual who has um, experience in testifying and being challenged and being confronted. One case I had, um, the question was the law of a U.S. state governing a pharmaceutical license agreement. And both sides engaged former federal judges to opine on the law. And it will come as no surprise to those of you who are U.S. practitioners that the former federal judges were not used to being challenged. They were not used to being cross-examined. And as a result, their effectiveness was, shall we say, compromised. So I look at the credentials, and then I look at the experience. I think that's very important, particularly if there is the likelihood of um, a confrontational presentation. I've, I've used both. I've had first-time experts, and uh, there's, there's sort of a balance here, and it really depends on the question. Um, do I have the foremost expert or one of the top experts in there who's never testified that may overwhelm my preference, like Jim's, that I'd rather have somebody who's both. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather have the, the right expert and, the, and somebody who's experienced at it. Um, and that's where the interviewing and the judgment may be is, okay, if I have a brand new expert, how is this person going to withstand cross-examination? And that's where I think you need more intensive interviewing if you're going to go forward with that person. And sometimes the, you know, the, the weeder of the industry or the, the, the top person will be the most credible, uh, the one who has written the articles, who is at the forefront of it, and it can't be challenged by the other experts or it would be very difficult for them to attack them. That can be very over, that can, that can be overwhelmingly um, credible to, and persuasive to the panel. It's just, um, it's, it's, that doesn't happen that often, but I have had those instances. Well, thanks to our panelists for their insights, and thanks to all of you for listening. As I mentioned, if you submitted a question that we haven't answered, we'll follow up with you directly. Should you have any additional questions related to today's topic, please feel free to email them to Jean Shim at jshim, J-S-H-I-M, at mayorbrown.com. And if you're interested in learning more about the ICC Young Arbitrators Forum, please visit the website linked on your screen. Thank you.